joining us and to my esteemed panel and more importantly to the Institute, which I have got to know fairly well recently, as well as a number of the students. So I probably know some of you in the audience as well. Thank you very much for joining us. What we're going to be talking about today is what has landed on the board's agenda. Why is that important to us? It's very important because as in the words of, I think it was in one of our conversations is, it's up to all of us. We all have to do this. So COP26, it feels like more happened than COP25. And it feels like more has happened, but in a different way to uh, the Paris COP back in 2015. So risk and the agenda for the climate and for business is now in the boardroom. And that is where it belongs. And in the words of Dr. Patrick soon Siong, who is one of the leading um, uh, medical people in developing the vaccine for numerous things, including COVID. And he was saying one of the things we don't know, because we're not clever enough yet, which was a very, very profound statement, is we don't know if we've already tipped the planet too far. We just don't know yet. And the solutions are going to come from things we don't know how they are yet or how they're going to be created. One of the things we're going to test and chat about later. We talk about the acronym of ESG, and every single one of you sitting with us today, you're going to have a different answer as to what ESG actually means. It's environment, it's social, it's governance. So those are the three things that we, I call it, in my words, the modern agenda. And this modern agenda is extremely critical. Environment, what are we doing to our planet? What are we doing putting stuff into our air? What are we doing to our oceans? What are we doing in our supply chain and moving around the planet? Social, what are we doing with the development of business on the other side of our supply chains? What are we doing in terms of social communities, the impact of what we're doing in places where we are delivering infrastructure, for example? What is the impact on gender-based violence when we are disturbing social norms? These are critical issues we've got to deal with as businesses, we can't ignore them. At the governance side, I think this is the one part of the agenda that probably is on most boards uh, radar because we've had regulation around gender quotas, uh, ethnicity quotas, suggestion around age and digital interests to be brought into the boardroom. So I think this one we have in our journey as boards got a little further than we have on potentially the other two, but particularly the environment one. So if I look back just to ground us for a moment before we chat to the panel, is one of the key goals that were set for COP26. So let's understand those because they are quite simple. There are four of them. Secure global net zero by mid-century and keep warming to one and a half degrees Celsius. Adapt to protect communities and natural habitats, including assisting those countries most vulnerable to climate change. Mobilize finance, in, and obviously we're talking about green financing, and be able to actually do something with that money that is effective, that is making a difference, and work together to be totally inclusive to deliver the above by creating a Paris rule book. So those are the things that we're looking at as to what the four key goals were of COP26. So our panel, you have been briefly introduced to them um, already. Brian Laughlin, who is from um, NASDAQ, um, and I'm going to not just run through them now. I do expect a very interesting conversation. I'll reintroduce each of the speakers just before we chat to them so that you've got it in context for the time of that conversation that we are sharing. I will be having a chat to each of our three panelists, one after the other, so that their points of view are so different. Normally, I like to mix my panel up and chat to all of them uh, differently, you know, intermingle the conversation. But our our points of reference are quite different. So we'll mix them up at the end and please use the Q&A function. It is there. I will pick up what you're putting there and we will build that into the conversation where feasible. So thank you for joining us. Uh, Byron, you have got the honor of being first up, uh, sitting there in NASDAQ behind you. Um, Byron and I are kindred spirits. We spoke the other day for the first time. We'll be meeting in a week's time uh, in physical person, not in this, this strange environment of the flat, flat world that we're in. Um, we're both passionate about board excellence, board effectiveness, boardroom dynamics. 
These are what make our companies sustainable, viable, doing the right thing, and therefore the right purpose. These are also critical to board excellence. He's the head of uh, board engagement at NASDAQ and is offering companies governance solution evaluations uh, through their Center for Board Excellence and effectively what we do for the FTSE here in the UK. Um, so we're going to be talking at, about the G element probably a bit more than we might be talking about the ENS, but let's see how the question, how the time and the conversation goes. Um, Byron, from the other side of the pond where you are, at a macro level, what do you think COP26 has done for business in terms of encouraging them to be taking further responsibility? Well, I, I, I think that what we've seen is a significant shift over the last five years to recognizing the, the need to focus on e, ESG issues holistically. Initially, you know, coming out of the World Economic Forum in around 2005, ESG was in the background for primarily for people who were focused on, on governance related issues and climate. And the social was, was present, but it was a little less so until uh, I think it was 2008 in the, the GFC that, that really sprung into action what's wrong in the governance environment. And so what we've seen is a trend and a, that, that started probably coming out of um, around the turn of the century where we had shifted from being an era more of management focus and management excellence, if you will, to shifting to saying, hold on a second, we, we need to look at governance and the role of the board and that's why 2008 was such a pivotal moment because I think it caused people to say, hey, the board has absolute authority because it can hire and fire the CEO. And so from that point to today, I think the shift has been that, that areas like caring, the duty of care is, that comes out of, in the United States, it's out of the, um, the Court of Chancery in Delaware where, where that is, hotly debated. And this idea of caring, I think, is elevated. So caring about governance, caring about uh, the S side of it, which I'm sure we'll get into a little more. I actually like to spend a lot of time on the S. So what I've seen is a shift towards an era of governance. And that governance excellence has caused board members to elevate, and they're paying more attention to things like BlackRock's letter. You know, it's like a, uh, a bell ringing around the world because a $10 trillion does have an effect. And, and when you add it up with BlackRock and State Street and Barclays and, you know, the, the, the larger investors of the world that are all ringing that bell that we're talking about today, suddenly boards are, are really listening. I mean, I do my work, board evaluation work globally and am in boardrooms almost uh, daily, if not weekly, around the world. And this issue of one, the war on talent, which has its implications globally, two, the climate, and how can our habitat, I love the word that was used a couple of times around habitat, because what we're really talking about in terms of environment and the existential concerns, I mean, we should put COVID kinds of concerns into the environment because it's a habitat concerned and an, a potentially existential kind of issue. And the, and the G side of it, how all of this is, is governed and governed well. And, and so what we are focused on at the center at NASDAQ is how do these areas impact resilient markets? And so, so Cobb and, and looking through the lens of, we wanna see the marketplace stabilized as much as possible through good governance and working through. And that's where, that's the connective tissue, I think that brings us all together to something like this. And so that's our, we're seeing a, a much more elevated viewpoint from boards and, and of course, CEOs, members of the board and looking at governance more holistically. 
Thanks, Baron. You made reference in what you've just said now to human capital management. Um, if we are looking out for the G and to a certain degree, the S aspect of uh, ESG in the space of human capital management, please can you give us some of your understanding, value, insights of the importance of human capital management to every organization, whether they are large or small? Sure. Well, I, I'm a stakeholder capitalist. And I'll emphasize that I am a capitalist. That's not a euphemism to me. And that so human capital management is, is about how the board and managers work together to, to fuel business through because it's people that make the, the, the work happen. And it's our employees from top to bottom. So looking at tone and and the environment of business so that we can connect those terms a, a bit. You know, if you, it, uh, uh, one of the more important statements uh, I've ever heard was back in my business school days, many years ago, a, a guy named Rob Kaplan, who was a professor at Harvard Business School. He was a uh, vice chairman at Goldman Sachs, uh, highly decorated uh, leader. He's the uh, Fed chair at, in Dallas here in the United States. His research, extensive research said, happy employees are the most productive employees. And I think it's a pregnant statement in the sense that people who love their work and, and many CEOs cherish that idea of having a great place to work. And it's highly challenged in the COVID environment. So the area of human capital management, if your employees don't love their job, if they don't feel appreciated, and of course, that ebbs and flows a bit. Uh, being a manager, it, 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 it's, it's constantly working at this. It, it poses a much more difficult environment. What, one of the more outstanding changes in governance that I've seen in the last eight years is that's gone from, an, from a comment where we're providing um, support, you know, much lower level. Um, words of concern, that's really management's job to manage, to, to manage the, the human capital element of a business, to the board holistically really caring about the, the environment of work in a way that speaks to that. Do our employees, are we attractive to businesses? I mean, is, are we attractive as a business to uh, prospective employees. So that's elevated considerably. And, and I'll just offer to the audience through my work in the boardroom, that is number one or number two on almost every board evaluation action point today is how are we wrestling with um, humans and therefore with uh, caring for our employees and their, their uh, love for their work. We can't, as we said, people make things happen, whether they are customers, whether they're employees, whether they are supply chain, manufacturing, humans are so important. And as we say in boardroom dynamics, it's the people who make things go wrong. But equally, it's the people who start things to make things happen. And if they're not going to get them to happen, you know, it, we have to look after our people and boards really are picking up on that um, far better since the COVID environment. I hope it lasts deep into the future. Um, and talking about deep into the future, you also mentioned in that opening statement, the word resiliency. We need to be there as financially sustainable organizations that have a defined purpose. That's one of the co quotes out of, one of, our, out of our governance code here in the UK. Mm -hmm. The world has been heavily hit by the pandemic. I think risk um, committees and boards have maybe got a little bit of this message that risk needs to be managed and we need to be resilient as organizations. Can you elaborate on your findings in this space? Sure. So the, the as, as we look at, um, as we look at our our work environment, 
the, the, the biggest concern today is why are people leaving work? And, uh, and this, you know, what's been nicknamed the, the great resignation is one of the, is one of the key concerns today. And, and then our, our concerns about, you know, this ebb and flow concern about, uh, about the, the pandemic. So as we look through the lens of, of um, the, the stakeholder piece, and one point I wanted to make is that NASDAQ, uh, many people don't know this, NASDAQ powers through our technology, 120 of the global markets. Um, so when you're trading in various places around the world, you may be using technology that was developed by NASDAQ. And so from a business model, we're very concerned about that. But from a governance model, we're also supportive of that. And that's why I'm at NASDAQ is because NASDAQ sees the importance of a connective element between governance and, and, and long-term market resiliency so that, you, so that the investors have confidence, one, that they can trade um, and that it's going to happen. I mean, think about that. Yeah, just the fact that each day we wake up, the bell rings in each respective market around the world and trading occurs. It's a, it's a fantastic thing we have. And that resiliency that we have confidence that that's a, going to occur is all about governance. And it's, it's important in the sense of why we're here speaking about these things today, because they support the resiliency of the markets. And as we grow and, and interact internationally, we want to have confidence that, that the, the markets are going to open. So this is why I think that, that the stakeholder element is so important because it, it starts with the people as you uh, emphasized, but those people in, in, aren't just our employees or our customers or our vendors, there are suppliers, the, the communities that we work within. It's this understanding that there is a connectivity to what we're talking about that is very important to the confidence factor because if you're not confident in the market, the markets are going to drop. You know that's what happened yesterday. People are concerned that that uh, COVID and the Fed's going to raise interest rates, and suddenly the market's down 600 points. So that's a confidence factor that we're seeing at play. As a forex trader, I've had some very interesting few days, least of all weeks, particularly one of our key currencies being the rand, has been very, very interesting with all the COVID issues there. Absolutely. Um, I've got a couple of other things that I'm going to reserve and come back to you, Byron, towards the end when we're having a more open conversation. I'd like to turn to Inga, please, at this point. And I would refer to Inga as another kindred spirit, somebody who understands and or is she's so understated but yet has this amazing, powerful vision and energy. And with that comes one of the more, more strategic minds I have come across in a long time. Very interesting conversations that we have had before today. She's passionate about environment and social development uh, goals, which is something that we all talk about now, the SDGs, and these new acronyms that are coming at us, as well as having um, being very bold about policy innovation to support corporates to think differently. So Inga comes at some of these things from a different perspective um, and also more from the um, force for good at a number of different levels, which I hope I'm going to manage to cover some of these, Inga, while we're having a quick chat. Um, you have a number of modern agenda passions, passions, uh, woman empowerment, social impact, climate change, just to name a few of the things that you're interested in. You were at COP26. Share with us some of the en energies that you picked up directly from there. Well, thank you for all that flattering introduction. <laughs> I might get to believe it. <laughs> but um, yes, COP. COP was very different this time, I thought. Um, first of all, there was an enormously high expectation of COP and unrealistically so, I think, given that we had the hiatus from COVID and many of the teams couldn't get there to negotiate. Um, and of course, in the interim, since uh, the previous COP, we've actually really begun to realize that this is not going to go away. Um, and that the penny has really dropped, that this is a massive existential threat um, at every level, whether, you know, political, business, social, um, and that we have to deal with it. So I think that actually has been a not nice to, it's a must do big shift in that. Um, 
it was also a COP where you had a much greater presence of civil society, including young people. And um, John Kerry was quite well, funny in the sense that he said they, they actually were now fearing more um, the young people the, <laughs> more than anything else and the opinions of the young people um, than uh, they were of, of the negotiations failing. But I do think um, there were some big shifts. And one of those was that it became very evident the inability of the political system generally to deal with the present while also anticipating the future. Um, that is a weakness. And, and it's partly because the political system is, of course, so short, um, it has such a short tenure. But it is clear that business has a much better ability to do that. And so the financial sector and the private sector crowding into this has been really, really important turning point, I think. Um, and will, I feel, drive where we need to get to. Um, if, of course, um, we do actually also contextualize this in on a systems basis and actually understand that, and I totally agree, um, with Baron, on the, the, the sort of stakeholder piece, but the stakeholders are much wider. You know, the stakeholders are now global because we now understand ourselves to be so much part of a global system. And so we have to be able to deal as corporate boards with the issues at hand and running the business and you know, being good stewards. But at the same time, we have to be able to anticipate and be stewards of the global. And that's much more challenging. So um, take, for example, the Arctic, which is an area we've got involved in um, more from a strategic point of view, because you know, losing those thermostats of the earth will affect every single business decision you make. We most likely will see 60 million climate refugees. We are already seeing more climate refugees than we are war refugees. So you know, having to contextualize within those, the big picture, your existing business, I think is a massive challenge for boards. But I think it's also a very exciting one. So there were, you know, there were obviously some very good takeaways um, and uh, $100 trillion. I'm not sure there even is that amount of money around, but anyway, that's the, the plan is that that will be the amount of money that the private sector plans to, to spend on transitioning us from where we are to where we have to be and to keeping to 1.5. Um, just on the ESG, so I think, you know, whereas ESG was the preserve of generally sustainability departments or head of sustainability, if they even had one, um, now ESG is being understood as really just basically, how do we live? How do eight or nearly 8 billion people live on this little earth in a sustainable way and still be able to run our businesses and live life? Um, a life of well-being and how do we also do that in a more just way so that the vast majority actually um, two-thirds of the world who are what we would call living in under in underdeveloped countries also participate in that growth without uh, making it in a, in a sustainable way so that they can participate in that growth and that is a massive challenge for us all but an exciting one Absolutely a challenge. Uh, some lovely quotes that I picked up from what you were saying there. Really interesting. You have a project which you made reference to in this little piece that you've just chatted about was the um, Arctic crisis and the, um, I think you talk about the um, Arctic angels. Share with us what you are doing specifically in this space to make a difference, because that is really about directly going into the heart of climate change. Absolutely. So when Sally Rani, my co-founder and I sat down four years ago now, uh, we actually met on a bank board um, and we were revisioning her foundation and we did a deep dive into climate and we realized that actually there is very little prioritization in the climate space. There is an enormous amount that's being done, which is terribly exciting. You know, we're, we're planting trees up the gazoo, we are taking plastics out the ocean, there's technology, there's hydrogen, there's... But 
actually, in terms of thinking about it as systems, we really were ignoring some of the key elements that would cause the most trouble, if you like. And if we lose the Arctic, I mean, the Arctic and the Antarctic were sort of up there somewhere. Um, and for me, too, I'm not overly passionate about polar bears and penguins, frankly. Um, but from a from a strategic point of view, which is my corporate background, the strategic planning, if we lose those, it's game over for most things, frankly. You know, we can keep planting trees, we can keep taking plastics out the ocean, but we can't plant ice. And the consequences are phenomenal. So it should, it, you know, obviously you're not going to be able to preserve the ice without getting to 1.5. So it should be a very, very strong SOS to keep to 1.5. And we're already feeling the consequences of that. If you're an insurance company and you were insuring Texas, you would realize, you know, that the polar vortex that hit Texas um, is part of that. The floods that we've had in Germany is part of that. The fires, the heat bubble that we had is part of this jet stream, um, the polar jet stream weakening and wobbling. Um, so we're only just beginning to understand how these systems are all desperately interdependent. The same with the oceans, you know, the impact on the oceans. Once we start losing the reflective capability of that ice, the oceans start warming and absorb more and more carbon. And of course, that changes things like fishing. So if you're running a fishing industry, um, that has an impact. So everything is interconnected and interdependent. Um, and for us, that then became a priority to highlight that. But also not only that, but to do it in a way um, where we were understanding the trends that are driving things and including that is how do we look at the social justice piece and how do we also include youth voices and make it a genuinely intergenerational organization from the get-go. And I think this is where boards can learn enormous amount is actually bringing young people into their boards, whether it's as a shadow board or even you know, um, shadowing a board member directly. Because young people like Zanaji are incredibly up to speed with what's happening, many of them. And we have this network of Arctic Angels who are young women leaders who are just awesome. I mean, Shea Bastida sat, uh, was the representative for the Biden summit. Um, Alexandria, one of our Arctic Angels, actually opened the COP summit. So these are voices that are wise as, long, as well as knowledgeable, and they should be given platforms. And that was what we created, was an organization where we actually create platforms for young people to voice their concerns, but also to be engaged so that they can take over um, and support what's being done now, but also they're the ones, of course, are the recipients of the choices that we make now. So that was a really important piece for us. Um, and maybe if I've got a minute, I'll, I'll go into saying why we chose for it to be a female-led and a feminine organization. Um, that's not to say we don't have young men, we do, Sanaji, others, Arctic Ice Force, um, <clears throat> but, the role of the feminine now, I think, is something that is also being recognized. I'm not here talking about gender. I'm talking about an ability to set self aside and to look at the whole. And that is a very strong feminine trait. And so that's why we decided to create a feminine organization. And it certainly is paying off. I mean, there's a, there's a particular energy about it that is, is very special. Um, so, yes, yeah, so our, our call is very much for a 10-year moratorium on the Central Arctic Ocean, um, definitely to prevent business as usual, deep sea mining, the idea of having nuclear dumping or having a Suez Canal across the transpolar route just to be able to ship LNG faster. Business as usual is just not an option in that space. So, so that's our big call, and that's what why we have this intergenerational voice that is is um, certainly getting heard in that space. More that I'd love to ask you now, but in the interests of time, to make sure that we give everyone a fair chance before we open for questions, um, I'll come back to you shortly, Inga. You've talked about intergenerational. 
we have one of our younger individuals with us, Synergy Artist, um, who um, I just look at and I think, oh, to be young again. <laughs> all the opportunities that a 21 year old has today versus what you had 30, 40, 20 even years ago. The opportunities for the youth to have a voice for the, the globalization of uh, the messaging and the content and being able to zoom in the way we are doing. I can chat to Zanaji as though I've known him all my life and yet you know, we've got decades between us in interest, age and everything else. And if you look behind, just over, uh, to the side of his shoulder, I see something I recognize, a kid's book about climate change. Not only do we have a 21 year old, we have an author who is a co-founder of his own business, which is called Zero Hour. This is a wise owl who's achieved so much by the age of 21. I knew I'd started my own business and had a career and had studied and everything but at 21, which so many people have done none of. I'm humbled, extremely humbled by what Zenergy has done and his focus and his ability to be so eloquent and to share these messages. You had the honor of being at COP26. Um, please share with us from your perspective, which will be different to Inga's, um, what COP26 meant to you, first of all, as an individual and the experience, but second of all, what do you think COP26 was achieving? What was all about? Where do you think the um, outcome will land? Yeah, so I think that um, really Inga's reflection on, on what happened at COP26 was very true. I think that there are such great limits to what government can accomplish at these conferences. And of course we've had, this is with the 26th one and we are still not on track to meet 1.5. And so um, young people around the world were climate striking, we're meeting with elected officials and yet uh, when we got to COP26, um, it was clear that governments had already decided what they were going to compromise on, what they were willing to negotiate. And we know that climate change is a non-negotiable issue. We have to meet 1.5 um, or below if we are to prevent the worst impacts of climate change around the world. So it was great to be at COP as an observer, um, but also uh, a very clarifying experience to understand that really the, the lead up to COP27 and the entire year ahead will determine what happens there. And after arriving at COP26, at that point, it was too late to really influence what the US plan would be. Um, so that was interesting. Um, but I would say, I mean, the best part about it was being able to connect with other organizers to meet other people who are actually working on this issue and have authority to make changes in their own lives for institutions on this issue. I uh, got to meet Inge there as well. And so, uh, yeah, I, I would say um, it was clarifying in the way that we have to act wherever we can, where we have authority to in our own lives. You said to me the other day, <clears throat> when I asked you, what can we all do? And you said, everybody can make a difference. Everybody can get involved. Please expand on that because you might have a mother at home, you might have a board chair, governments in between, uh, continents apart. How can we all make a difference? Yeah. So um, at Zero Hour, we talk about climate change as a systems problem. And so we need systems level solutions to address it. We need corporations, we need financial institutions and government because they're these large institutions that can make such vast change. But also individuals can do a lot as well. And actually we can look at individuals as a method of scaling up solutions for these larger institutions. So things that you think about a lot related to sustainability include um, sustainable transportation. You know, how are you deciding to get to work every day? And from a, an institutional perspective, you could think about what your corporate vehicle fleet is like if you have one, how you're transporting products and really thinking about um, supply chain and how that can be more sustainable. Uh, and so thinking about the ways in which we have um, 
control over different areas. Um, personal finance, where you decide to do banking, it could also be related to how you decide pension funds for your employees. Are you choosing pensions that uh, invest in fossil fuels still? If, if there is an option not to do that, are you pursuing that? Are you pressuring the, the pension fund that you're working with to make changes? And so uh, there's lots of avenues for actually deciding to be more sustainable once you understand where you can actually make an impact. And so every day we made the conscious decision to either continue on the same path we're going on or to make change or to learn more about how we can make change. And so I think that every day, every single person can decide to make that change. If you look at businesses, um, consultancies, um, things like that, we were talking about things like um, building air conditioning, yeah, things like that, uh, which complements that you were talking of a much bigger picture uh, in what you've given us now. But from what I understand from you, we can actually go right down to the micro level. And the sum of those micro levels can bring us a, um, a combined outcome that might not feel like you're making a difference, but everyone together is making a difference. Um, you talked about um, government and institutions, and we were talking a moment ago about BlackRock and some financing, and Inga also made reference to the large amounts that have been committed to this project. What are the things they can invest in now, and if we're looking at the planning towards COP27, what activity can institutions and governments be doing today for the next 360 odd days, but, but, but less than 340 days before the next COP, so that we have had an outcome from this one. And by the way, please, everyone, can we have some questions uh, put up in the chat line? We've got some, we'd like a few more. So if you can um, give us some input, that will be helpful. And we can then change from my questions to yours to get the depth. Thank you, sorry, Zanaji, please go ahead. Yeah, so uh, I personally, I mean, I'm, I'm still a student right now and don't have an actual background in finance, but um, our organizers at Zero Hour are working on uh, fossil fuel finance. And I think that um, apart from actually investing in renewable energy and in um, new ventures that are exploring new ways to produce energy sustainably, uh, we have to end fossil fuel financing. I think that it's long past time to end expansion of fossil fuels, and that is just misaligned with uh, the goal of net zero by 2050, and even interim goals for 2030. We can't achieve net zero while also simultaneously expanding fossil fuels. And to that many might say our energy consumption is increasing. And so how are we going to meet that new demand without expanding fossil fuels? And I think that there are ways to do that with renewable energy. And now is really the time to fill that uh, expanded energy use with renewable energy. And we can provide capital to do that. And there are decision makers around the world who have the capacity to do that. And we are at a point where we have to take action and there is, there is nothing that uh, should stop us from doing that. And uh, I was very moved uh, the other day by a video from a uh, Congresswoman from New York, uh, Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez um, from the US and she was talking about healthcare um, and the fact that um, our lives are not a commodity. Um, and talking about that in the US related to healthcare, but I think it can be related to climate change. And she mentioned that anyone would pay anything. They would go into debt, they would leave the country, um, they would do anything to, to get access to healthcare to live. And we have to be thinking about that in the same way for climate change, because we, yeah, yeah. I, it, climate change is about survival. It is about our futures. And so we have to be thinking about doing everything possible we can today to advance that mission. 
We were having a conversation with a specific province in South Africa the other day, which is a province that is, its economy is run on two things, tourism and coal. What are they doing as a provincial government to restate their purpose into agriculture and commerce and sustainability rather than coal? And 2015, 50, 15 is gone. 50, it's just around the corner. We have no idea how close it is. And if we don't start now, as you were saying, we're not going to get there. One of the questions is, what frustrates you most that people are not listening and therefore not delivering? Where's your personal frustration? Yeah, I think, um, so I am the policy director for Zero Hour. So most of what I do is uh, working on federal policy um, in the US. And I think that really it is, um, like Inge mentioned earlier, um, inclusion of youth voices. I think that there is a big disconnect um, between how different generations are viewing climate change. And for young people, we, we really are seeing this as if we don't take action today, um, we risk not having a future later. And um, that sort of urgency isn't always felt um, by business leaders, by government leaders. And uh, that is frustrating because um, we are advocating in the streets for these issues um, and yet are not invited in to, uh, at, to have a seat at the table. And even at COP26, we were observers, but also we there were closed meetings. Um, many of the negotiations were in these closed meetings um, where observers weren't actually allowed to be. And so there are just so many bureaucratic barriers and red tape around involvement and around getting the right people at the table. And I think that's one of the most frustrating things. Byron, if I may come to you, please. How, how do boards actually listen, genuinely listen to the voice of the stakeholder, wh whoever that stakeholder may be, whether they're a minority stakeholder to the business or a major impact stakeholder to that business? Are they listening? And if they're not, how are we going to help them to listen? Well, I, I would offer that boards do listen. Right. Um, it's, it's important who, and, and I think we're touching on this, who is coming to the table, per, the, the virtual or proverbial table, and speaking. And the, so investors, so influencing investors, and influ, influencing the, the influence of investors is very important in this discussion. So as investors take interest in a given subject, if it's an institutional investor down to a real retail investor, the more people that say, this is important to me and, and have that kind of existential moment, it is th the board will listen, but they'll also listen to their employees because employees can vote with their feet, they can leave. And this is one of the discussions today is are people choosing, are particularly younger people, choosing to work at places that share their values? Now, I, I will give one anecdotal piece that is of encouragement to me. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure most on this, uh, on this call are familiar with the Empire State Building. But what most wouldn't be familiar with is that the Empire State Building is powered by sustainable energy. So it's one of the oldest skyscrapers, one of the taller skyscrapers, yet the CEO cares passionately about this subject and chose to make the investment towards the long term of renewing the building so that it's more sustainable. That's an example of good leadership that I think that Sanji is going to. And that's what investors will listen to is a more long term, holistic, connected Connecting these pieces, I think it's very important for us to see that E, S, and G are connected, and we can continue to talk about that into the future so that investors, employ all stakeholders um, uh, understand the importance of what Zana G was talking about. I, I sense that a lot of companies are still battling with the 
climate change, fossil fuel, energy, renewable energy, the E part of it, as to how it is relevant to them and their business, because some it's obvious, but there are others it's not that obvious. And I think there's a big challenge there. One thing I did hear about the other day is that in the, there is financing, green financing available for companies that are innovative in their uh, climate change um, activities and objectives. So there is, they always talk about um, ESG being expensive to deliver. But we are hearing since COP26, I don't know if it existed before, that this financing, when justified for its purpose, is then making it a net neutral to actually make these vast degrees of change right down at the SME level. And that I found very rewarding to, uh, to learn about. Um, Inga, if we may come to you. Um, do you think the burning platform that boards are sitting on is understood? And do they have the recognition that doing nothing is actually one of the biggest, worst decisions they could be making? Well, I think increasingly um, that penny is dropping. Um, and that is for all sorts of reasons. I mean, it's... it's um, in, in Buddhism, there's this very interesting thing called interdependent arisings. So a lot of things that are that coalesce at one time, and that's what we're seeing. The the financial the, the Glasgow Financial Alliance that I was talking about that has committed all this money, and that's private sector money, um, is about driving and it's about conditional financing and driving change through financing. There's also, of course, new as you well know. Um, the, the disclosure requirements for boards. But then there is a much bigger push, I think, and that is coming from young people who are much more conscious about where they're going to put their money. You know, where will they, you know, what shares do they want to invest in? And the scrutiny, and there's much more need for transparency and much more requirement for integrity. I think that's another thing. I mean, people are not... Um, are, are much more upset by um, obfuscation or just lies rather than telling the truth and saying, we're going to try and fix this and make that transparent. And that is part of what this financing is about, is how do you actually transition heavy um, emitters and support them to change? And that I think is where we're getting some interesting things around collaboration. And I do feel that Boards that, of course, we've got such a body of evidence, too, of how cost effective it is becoming um, as the cost of, of energy drops and renewables drop. But more particularly, I think it needs to be seen as an opportunity agenda, because so much of what we will be investing in in the future hasn't even been invented, frankly. I mean, it's a bit like you know, pre-computer days, right? Um, so there is an opportunity agenda there to be had. And it's actually quite an exciting one. And I think it's a very exciting one. I think we must keep the, the hope alive also around this and not feel, oh, this is all doom and gloom and you know, let's pack it in. Um, we're all going to be underwater. There is a huge opportunity for young people too, who are moving or, or even middle management now to be doing things that are aligned with values and purpose-driven. And as you were saying, I mean, 10, 10, 20 years ago, you were pushing water uphill with a rake, trying to find jobs that did that for you. Whereas now there will be so many of those aligned jobs to be had. Um, and I, I think that's immensely positive um, for all of us actually, because I, I am actually almost slightly envious of this generation because yes, it's going to be a monumentally bumpy ride now for the next 20 years without question. But coming out of it will be the sort of systems that are much more aligned with a well-being world um, and not naively so, you know, that actually can still sustain business, yes. um, healthy business, but a much healthier business than we current or we've had in the last sort of 20, 30 years. And if you just look back, I mean, sorry, I'm probably taking a few bit of airtime here, but um, if you look back to Greenspan saying, you know, the, the purpose of business was, of course, you know, shareholder value and look 
to now a our, even our conceptualizing what shareholders are, but also understanding that this is a collaborative, interconnected, interdependent world, and that business has a really wonderful purpose, I think, also in bringing what Sanaji was saying, this ability to translate from an ambition to an, an end game and a result. And business is very good at that. Politics is pretty bad at that. And so we're going to be able to have to spend this 100 trillion, if we even can find it, but effectively being able to effective in the way we translate that into our world going forward and i think that is an enormous opportunity for boards um, to grasp that and those who don't will be falling behind they will. And by falling behind they're then not popular their products not popular their staff are not happy the investors are not happy the product doesn't get and so the company starts to fall and fail very quickly i just want to turn to sanaji for a moment so Najee, you talk about some of the new solutions to the problems we have, we can't even envisage yet. So I'm going to ask you to look into the future and give us some ideas of what areas, is it technology or is it energy? Where are we going to find some of these solutions we don't know about and don't have yet? Yeah, so I think that um, there, in energy specifically, I think that wind and solar are, I mean, they're two energy sources that we already have that could be scaled up way more um, than we have right now. And really uh, it's just a problem of addressing the electricity grids and actually being able to link uh, renewable energy to grids. And so where, where the sun shines the most, where the wind is blowing the most, to where that energy is actually needed. And so the innovation, I think, will really come uh, at the utility side uh, and understanding the grid. Um, but there's also um, lots of innovation happening for other areas. And so thinking about heavy industry um, and steel production, uh, for example, and using hydrogen as a replacement for coal. Um, and green hydrogen in particular, because um, we know that um, blue hydrogen um, or other forms that are drawn from fossil fuels, uh, from methane, are not uh, necessarily beneficial um, as a transition fuel. Um, but green hydrogen that forms from uh, electrolysis is actually um, very sustainable. It actually reduces water use, um, even though the input is water. Um, for electrolysis. And so that can be used um, for heavy industry, for steel, um, for other things that require this intense amount of energy that natural gas um, has been used for in the past, that coal has been used for in the past. Um, and so really, um, there are many different uh, alternatives for energy. And I think that that is an area that will really be um, interesting to see over the next decade um, as far as innovation. I think we, uh, and I remember going through the life of having the computer being something that came into our lives and we, then we had the mobile phones and then we had the internet and how our lives have, over the decades, something major has changed in our lives. And I'm looking forward to seeing what this next one is. Maybe I can get somewhere in a hurry much quicker than I can get there now. A question for you, Byron. Um, two, two perspectives. One is our investor capital globally tends to want short-term returns. Investors are equally looking at purpose, governance, um, leadership, um, longer-term sustainability is starting to have an influence in that space. But the other element is how are companies that you are involved in linking the remuneration KPIs of businesses to some of these new issues and new challenges. So we've got the investor stakeholder and we've got the employee stakeholder with them getting the money. Can you help us on those two topics? Well, I would offer that the shift that needs to continue to occur there is a longer term view towards investing. The short termism, I mean, that part of the problem coming out of uh, Friedman's work in the University of Chicago back in the 70s was this this notion of a, a short-termism viewpoint from, from a shareholder primacy uh, perspective. And the, the problem with that was, it, it, is it looked at areas like fossil fuels as 
quick and easy and um, and we've learned that that is problematic. So it's, I would offer that it, this is a generational change that must occur to look more holistically at a longer term investment horizon in which we, we also look at life. Uh, you know, it's sad to me that in, in developed places, we have so much unhappiness, you know, depression and unhappiness need to be linked to some of these things because at a practical level, even investor, I would hope, is interested in the their grandchildren and so on. And so it, I think some of this comes down, we can we can look out of out of COP26 and say, at a working daily level, what's important to the investor? It should be looking at the at their investments through a longer term lens that helps promulgate. The, the things that we're talking about that shouldn't be barriers to economic prosperity into the future. But it does have to, we, we have to depoliticize some of this and think closely about working together to solve problems, both at the micro level and at the macro level. And that, that attracts investors, that kind of things. Problem solving is areas where there can be economic benefit. And looking forward in an innovative and purposeful way. Exactly. The three of us could all have another three hours together. <laughs> but I know I'll get into deep trouble from the powers that be at the Institute. So I'd like to thank you all very, very, very much. It was so innovating, well, innovative and enlightening to have such a variety of content that we've just had. So at this moment, can I hand over back to the Corporate Governance Institute and thank you very much for attending those of us who have played to us who are still with us. Thanks very much, Sharon. Thanks to the panel. Um, it was a fascinating session. I think everyone could have, could have spent another couple of hours. So just to round off, um, we will have a recording of this session available um, um, today and then it will move into our paid members uh, section. So I'd like to thank everyone for attending today. Um, thanks to our panel. Um, Sharon, Zanaji, Inge, Byron, fascinating. Um, we'll finish off now just at 2 p.m. Um, our local time here. So take care, everyone. Bye-bye.